ಸಹನಾವಪತು ಸಹನೌನು ಸಾ ವೀರ್ಯಂ ಕರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಾವದೀತಸ್ತು ಮಾವಿಷಾವಹಾಯಿ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಮೇ ದಟ್ ವನ್ ಪ್ರೊಟೆಕ್ಟ್ ಅಸ್ ಬೋತ್ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ ಇನ್ ಟೀಚರ್ ಮೇ ದಟ್ ವನ್ ನರಿಶ್ ಅವರ್ ಲರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಮೇ ದಟ್ ವನ್ ಮೇ ವಿ ವರ್ಕ್ ಟುಗೆದರ್ ವಿತ್ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಎನರ್ಜಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಫಿಗರ್ may our uh, may we get some illumination from our studies may we not unnecessarily cavil with each other peace 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 be unto all so uh, let me just select one other person in and enable all right you're all good so i'm happy to see you all here and i was uh, beginning to think that maybe due to lack of advertising nothing would be with us so the re- the subject that i chose for the saturday is refinement in meditation and it's going to be a very loose kind of conversation and i'd much prefer it to be a some kind of question answer session because most of you will be meditating in some way or other in fact i think it's true to say that everybody meditates they may not recognize it today much of the world is meditating on the russian ukraine situation people are still have still been meditating on covid and so what is this meditation it is taking the energy that would normally throw flow through our consciousness and diverted it diverting it into a chosen direction you may say we didn't choose to think about the situation in europe we didn't choose to think about covid we didn't think we didn't choose to think about any of these negative things but the truth is that when you look down deeply all of these are chosen avenues of thought and what happens when something triggers this thought from the unconscious area and brings up an old friend as it were maybe even going way back from childhood or even a previous life what we call some scars unconscious impressions at some point or other they arrived in the conscious mind and established themselves as a habit so in order to practice anything in spiritual life we have to engage in a habit we have to create a counter habit we have to acknowledge that we have habitual behaviors and from there on we have to see how can we combat these through the conscious avenue we can never do it directly we can never do anything or to make any changes in the unconscious mind by directly changing the unconscious mind we can only do it through the avenue through the keyhole as it were of conscious experience ಈ ಅಭ್ಯಾಸ ವೈರಾಗ್ಯ ವ್ಯಹ ತನಿ ರೋಗ ದಿಸ್ ಕೈಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಕ್ಸಪ್ಟೇಷನ್ ಇನ್ ಪಟಾಂಜಲಿ ಯೋಗ ಸೂತ್ರಸ್ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಲೇಟ್ಸ್ ಟು ದಿ ಕಂಟ್ರೋಲ್ ದೇ ಕಂಟ್ರೋಲ್ ಕಂಟ್ರೋಲ್ ಆಫ್ ವಾಟ್ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟುಡ್ ದಟ್ ದೇರ್ ಆರ್ ವೇವ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ಆಲ್ ಟ್ರಸ್ಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಮೆಡಿಟೇಷನ್ it's useful to understand what is the geography of the mind five kinds of waves are identified right knowledge right knowledge is when we take this energy and steer it in an elevated way to access truth truth about what truth about anything and truth is verifiable we can hear truth from somebody it has a ring of truth but still it needs to be verified at the end of the day it has to be reasonable this we subject to our pros and cons evaluation we have to reflect on it but then we have to take the methodology and see for ourselves is it true is it not true and the primary methodology in spiritual life is meditation 
whether we approach spiritual life from the idea of love of God or the feeling of love of God, or whether we approach it from the idea of getting all our activities and using them in such a way that they don't disturb the mind, it's called karma yoga, or whether we make a wonderful evaluation of the world that tells us that normally what we're dealing with is in fact ephemeral and not lasting. These in turn are bhakti yoga, karma yoga, jnana yoga, but all of them agree on one thing, that meditation is necessary. The fourth aspect of equalizing these waves within the mind is necessary. It's an internal movement. It's an exploratory movement. And it's a revealing movement. And we might say that all of these other yogas are purificatory methods which pacify the waves in the mind. So it is seen that the mind is something like a field, something like an area of operation, where from the unconscious waves arise and they also consist of our reactions to external events. It's like accessing an internal library of ours, gaining all our experience that has gone through so many changes and so many lives and has accumulated it itself in a reference library. And whenever the occasion arises, with or without our consent, matching impressions come up into the conscious mind and have their play there. This comes then five varieties of waves according to the yogis. We've dealt with truthful waves, waves of truth. We should try to cultivate these. But then there are the opposite, waves of untruth, waves of ignorance, ranging from the way we interpret the world to the way we react to the world, you know, misunderstanding. And another category will be in the category of misunderstandings. Verbal delusion. Somebody says something and we react, we completely misunderstand. And most of our conversations are with ourselves. Even when somebody else is talking, we can catch ourselves in reframing an opinion or an answer. There are very few good listeners. The art of listening is indeed an art. What are the indications that we're not listening? Well, one indication will be that when somebody is talking, we're already reformulating or formulating an answer. Another is to interrupt somebody, completing their sentences for, for them. And when I give examples, I near, normally give some exaggerated, funny examples. The, the other day, I went to the supermarket. No, 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 I went to the airport. And there I met, oh, your cousin? No, 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 I met an old school friend. And then we talked about the old school days? No, 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 no. We talked about your health. You see how difficult a conversation like that is when we anticipate with a level of impatience. Proper listening requires empathy, cultivating sufficient patience in us to really connect on a feeling level with the other person. Very often, you know, when we talk about this high philosophy, we miss the humanity. We miss the emotional mind of the other person. And we go into an intellectual understanding of things. But that is not the purpose of our Vedanta philosophy, and it is not the purpose of our yoga practice. Another level of mind will be, or a level of wave will be sleep. All of us do it. And then, of course, there's memory. And when we interlock these two things, memory, and we call this dream. Now, these are five varieties of waves in the mind. And if we analyze the activity, the wavelength activity, electronically in the mind, or the brain, we should say, we can identify five types of waves in the brain, alpha, beta, theta, delta, and so on. All of these five types of brain waves will be commensurate with these five flavors, varieties of what we call rigidities, whirlpool waves, disturbances in the mind. But because of all these disturbances, we have no clarity. Things are confused. We struggle through life trying to make the best of what we have. But the real truth 
sits underneath all of these waves. And so the passage goes, their control, control of these waves, which are creating disturbances in the whole mental area that collectively we call chitta. Their control is by two things, practice and non-attachment. It's worthwhile reading Swami Vivekananda's commentary on this. He says, the mind to have non-attachment must be clear, good, and rational. Now, to have a clear, good, and rational mind is to deal with the emotional reactions that often come up. We have to have the capacity to stand back and review the events that are going on in the mental field. Why should we practice is the next question. Because each action is like the pulsations quivering over the surface of the lake. The vibration dies out. What is left? What is settled? What is the residue? We can compare it to water purification. We put some dust or some uh, fine particles. Fine and coarse particles can be mixed up in water or any solvent. And we see there is a settling according to the density of the particle according to the mass of the particle too. And so we can add an artificial flocculant to this to enable settling. The Shankaracharya in his Viveka Shodamani who mentions this example of a flocculant, that we can actually practice settling these muddy particles. And mud causes confusion. And confusion is compounded by actions and reactions. These actions and reactions come from a single base, a wrong identification with our true self, our authentic divine nature, with the products of it, or the objects of it, namely what we call body and mind. And there again, it's not that simple, because what we call mind is in fact another kind of body, a subtle body. These samskars, these impressions, when a large number of these impressions is left in the mind, they coalesce and become a habit. In other words, they settle like a flocculent. And the example has two varieties of it. One variety would be, to use it as an example, for a permanent storehouse of impressions. The other example can be used as a method to clarify all the things which have not settled. It is said, habit is second nature. It is first nature also, and the whole nature of man, everything that we are, is the result of habit. This is worth repeating over and over again. I wish you would change. Oh, it's my habit. It can be an excuse. It can say, it can infer, we can never change it. But you see, if a habit forms in this way, then it can change by making a counter habit. This is what is called practice. Swami Vivekananda goes on to say, that gives us consolation because if it is only habit, we can make and unmake it at any time. The samskaras are left by these vibrations passing out of our mind each one of them leaving its result. Our character is the sum total of these marks. And according as some particular wave prevails, one takes that tone. You'll notice that many people begin a kind of new look at themselves, a new adjure, a new review. Who am I? What is my makeup? What is my mask, otherwise called personality? This is why we conduct a fundamental course, Enneagram and Essence of Truth. It is saying, please have a look at this collection of habits that we declare to be ourselves. But it is only a mask. And it is not fixed. If it was fixed, we could never change it. But it is pliable. It is plastic. For that reason, we can change it. If good prevails, one becomes good, he says. If wickedness, one becomes wicked. If joyfulness, one becomes happy. The only remedy 
for bad habits is counter habits. The only remedy for bad habits is counter habits. Now, why would you have this on a whole range of subjects that are connected and that is a teaching about a methodology for meditation? Why would you talk about habits and counter habits? Isn't the subject meditation? Well, without cultivating this, without gaining a certain level of peace and self-control, meditation is an impossibility. Indeed, if you try it, it is actually dangerous. And we'll mention this later, because the yogis have a description for this. There's a certain language, symbolic language, for this potential energy and kinetic energy that they call kundalini, that, that which is coiled up, that which is potential. And of course, the great example is a coiled up serpent. Now we have to be careful when we deal with snakes. Any person from a snake park will tell you that there is a way of handling the snakes. And if you don't know this, you'll get bitten. You'll become a victim. So how do we handle this potential energy? We handle it with great patience. And we start by cultivating habits. We start by preparing the ground. This is our initial primary training. All the bad habits that have left their impressions are to be controlled by good habits, he goes on to say. Very simple. What is practice? The cultivation of useful, good, truthful habits that have no uh, vestige of egocentricity, no attachment to what we have confused it with, namely the confusion between subject and object, confusion between our ultimate, real, rich, deep, divine self, infinite consciousness with that which is fleeting, that which is material, that which comes and goes, that which is absolutely finite, and all the world that is built around that. Go on doing good, he says, thinking holy thoughts continuously. There's no holiday for it. It's continuously. Don't think that I'll do it on Sundays. Don't think that I'll do it only in the morning, only in the evening. My guru said I should do some spiritual practice in the morning and the evening. I should engage in sandhya as the sun goes down. No, there's no holiday for this. Right in the workplace, you have to do this. From getting up in the morning to going to bed at night. And the next morning, waking up with the same continuous thought, same continuous attitude. Now, part then of preparation for meditation, and meditation itself, is the use of what we call japa. Repetition, loving repetition of a holy name. And doing it in a meditative way, with great meaning. It is the guru, it is said, who whispers the mantra in the devotee's ear. But it is the he says that is the only way. He's not saying there are any alternative ways. He says that is the only way to suppress base impressions. We have to be careful about the use suppress because suppress is not the methodology of it. It is the effect of this. It is simply producing a counter habit. Never say any more any man is hopeless because he only represents a character, a bundle of habits. That's all. And the good news is habits can be changed, which can be checked by new and better ones. Character is repeated habits, and repeated habits alone can reform a character. See how many absolutes are contained in there. Only this, this alone. There's no other way, this kind of practice. Then this non-attachment is, I am not these habits. I'm not the product of these habits. It has nothing to do with me because I am the entity that can stand apart and control these things. If I was in any way 
these habits, if I myself was these habits, if these habits was not a character or a composite character or part of a personality, then I could never change anything. But the fact that I have the capacity to exercise control and produce continuously counter habits means that I am detached. Tatra stito yato abhyasaha continuous struggle to keep them again continuous struggle to keep them perfectly restrained is what is called practice now the word struggle is an awkward word you can use for convenience sake because in the beginning of spiritual life it does seem like a struggle because it's an unnatural thing to do what is easier is it easier to restrain horses or let them go? Well, to some extent, you might think it's easier just to let them go and have their way. But then you're out for mayhem. If you just take your hands off the steering wheel of a car and let it run its own course, you'll soon wind up in the ditch. Some continuous correction has to be made. It is done so automatically, we don't even think about it. As soon as the car rears off the left, we make the automatic adjustment to the right. What is practice, says Swami Vivekananda in his commentary? The attempt to restrain the mind, in jitta form, to prevent it going out into waves. Sahatu dirga kara nirantarya. It becomes firmly grounded by long constant efforts with great love for the end to be attained this has to be emphasized all spiritual practice should be a joyful loving process with a great love for what a great love for the end yes clarity which means the end pain mental pain and mental pain we know is not divorced from spiritual uh, from physical pain Mental pain has its immediate effect on the human body. If you ask somebody concerned with health, what is the primary cause of disease? It would be very valid to say, your mental stress is a primary cause. As soon as you think in a certain way, it has its, uh, its expression in the physical. There is uh, some people, there are some people who have skin irritations you see there was a somebody called louise hayes who made an inquiry she tried to identify if there's some kind of psychological mood or some kind of thought or feeling is it reflected in the physical and if so can we identify it exactly well somebody who's irritated might have an irritated skin Somebody who suffers from doubt or fear may have stomach problem. The stomach itself may doubt that this fear is, that this food is good. And so the first victim of poisonous, toxic thought is the human body itself. And I don't think the human body is in any way divorced from its environment. The body is something like a magnetic field. We can demonstrate this. In many talks, I give and have given in the UK and in France, I demonstrate how there is what we call the physical human body is in fact something like an electromagnetic field. We can disturb it by a gaze. We can disturb it at a distance. In short, we can disturb it by a thought. Now, our philosophy is based on some very clear principles. These are the Sankhya principles. There are 24 of these. And one mind, one cosmic mind, is only there according to the system. A kind of solipsism, which many people ridicule, but I have my own mind. I make up my own mind, is what you haven't been what you've been talking about, not based on an individual steering of an individual mind. It does seem like that. But think about this. Supposing this morning you tuned in on the radio to RTE or any other news station, is it that 
dissertation is your individual property? Or is there a general broadcast that you manage to tune into? Is there only one broadcasting station that has the effect of delivering exactly the same broadcast or simultaneously as will be received at your transistor, your personal radio? So with only one mind, think now of the effect. Only one mind is there. It makes all thought completely infallible. But you see, any intention that you have designed to carry through to the end can easily be neutralized by a doubt or a fear or a temptation, something that the senses engage in and we take it seriously and we bring it into our formula for dealing with situations. So, great love has to be engaged in all these activities. When we sit for meditation, there has to be a great love for what we are meditating on. There has to be a great love for the process. There has to be a great faith, a great confidence, a great joy. Otherwise, when we sit for meditation, we will be struggling. And in struggling, we will think this is a very unnatural and pleasant thing, and we will give up particularly if in meditation we have the wrong idea about it. If we think that meditation is making the mind blank, then this would be a wrong process and we'll have no joy in it. We'll only have sleep and dullness. If we think that meditation is fixing the mind on one thing, this will also have a deleterious effect. We'll get mesmerized and we'll start uh, getting bored. No, all meditation is a form of bringing in an adventurous line, an internal script that unfolds, initially using imagination, using our own creativity, and attaching our deep feeling to this. And so when yogis describe this transference of potential energy to kinetic energy, described as the unfolding of the Kundalini, they have to take into account that this unfolds naturally, there's an evolution in it, and that the easiest way to do it is not to attend to any of those yogic practices, but simply to center in the depth of your heart, your emotional heart, your emotional center, a great, great image of that which provides rhythm and free flow of grace to you that religion calls God. Taking that personal, most beloved form, centering your attention on that with a great deal of imagination, using all the vision capacity that you have in glorious technicolor with bright blues and bright greens, engaging all the senses so that all of the whole of the mind, that portion of the mind called indriyas, the internal senses, gets an internal lift, an internal rapture. All this energy rising up through the body is equivalent to the awakening of this kundalini, this potential energy. What a glorious thing it is. And so, love of God is the main means of awakening this potential energy, this serpent power. Now be careful, you see, as I mentioned before, a serpent is dangerous. We can't unleash it all in one go. We have to prepare the way. We have to make sure that all the mind is nicely purified by these counter habits. Restraint does not come in one day says Swami Vivekananda, but by long, continued practice, when will it come, when will it come, is not a good question. Because what you have is actually here and now. It's to come. And this anticipatory urge to get something done instantly is in fact counterproductive. It's not going to happen in a day. 
and all spiritual practice and all spiritual effects and all spirituality is not linear. Please be prepared for moments of dryness. Please be prepared for circular moments where nothing happens. You may get a good meditation one day, but the next day it may be absolutely dry. This some mystics call the dark night of the soul. This dryness can come because progress is not linear. Two things are required. Continuity in daily life. Repetition, loving repetition of your divine name, otherwise known as Japa, continuously. Throughout your waking day, throughout your whole waking life, is a means of connecting you with the divine presence in every moment. And with that connectedness and that purity of mind, when you sit down for meditation, the mind naturally is prepared. Now with this, you can see a little bit of struggle will take place initially because this is not the way we have learned to think or react from our very childhood. We have to teach the mind in a new way and we have to be patient with it. Purity, patience and persistence these are the three necessary qualities in spiritual life. So the fact that we had a good meditation one day does not guarantee it the next day. It depends on the condition of the mind. That's, that's the one factor. The second factor is divine grace. It is really only the divine grace that moves towards us that will assist us in this revelation. Again, if we use the image of a serpent power, the image of an unfolding, coiled up entity, serpent, it requires two things. It requires the preparation of the way for easy access, no obstacles. And it requires the internal movement in that itself. It requires an internal movement beyond our control that transmutes potential energy into kinetic energy, otherwise known as divine grace. God's divine grace, always flowing to us. And when we allow it, by removing the obstacles through cultivation of counter habits on the one side, and have faith in its internal shift and internal movement, depending on its will, we're all entirely dependent on this mother goddess's will. That effect which comes to those who have given up their thirst after objects, either seen or heard, and which wills to control the objects, that's called non-attachment. Drishta, Anushlavika, Vishaya, Vritra, Isnasya, Vaishikara, Samnya Varagyam. This non attachment Varagya. Vivekananda continues the commentary. The two motive powers of all our actions are one, what we see ourselves, and two, the experience of others. These two forces throw the mind, that is, compared to the lake, into various waves. Renunciation is the power of battling against these forces and holding the mind in check. Their renunciation is what we want. I am passing through a street and a man comes and takes away my watch. That is my own experience. I see it myself and it immediately throws my chitta, my mind stuff, like a lake into a wave, taking the form of anger. Allow not that to come. If you cannot prevent that, then you are nothing. If you cannot control your own emotions, a replay of your childhood reaction. Somebody took a toy from me. I immediately cr cried, stamped my feet. I got angry. I might have bitten something. I might have hit something, whatever it was. My frustration. All of that hasn't changed in many adults. We have this expression, 
he threw his toys out of the cart. Something happened and there was the immediate reaction. And if you really see and observe what happened, they're simply behaving as they behave when they were five years of age. We have to avoid childishness, but we have to encourage childlikeness, a simplicity. What a wonderful version of virtue is, simplicity and purity. If you can, you have vairagya. If you can check this impulse, then you have vairagya. You have detachment. Why? Because when the wave of anger came, at one point when you said, I'm angry, you identified with the wave. Again, the experience of the worldly minded, he continues, teaches us that sense enjoyments are the highest ideal. These are tremendous temptations. To deny them and not allow the mind to come to a waveform with regard to them is renunciation. To control the twofold motive powers arising from my own experience and from the experience of others, and thus prevent this chitta from being governed by them. This is called vairagya, detachment, otherwise also known as renunciation. These should be controlled by me and not I by them. I should be a master. I should not be a slave. The other day we were, we had an event on Wednesday and we were talking about St. Patrick and how St. Patrick's life is a wonderful illustration of the principle of going from slavery to freedom. And I happen to mention, you see, in the Vedanta philosophy, I'll go is freedom. Freedom because at the moment most of us are slaves, slaves to our passions, slaves to our desires. And so this freedom, when we talk about freedom, we're not talking about gender freedom, we're not talking about human rights, we're not uh, talking about freedom of expression, we're talking of true freedom where there are no restraints whatsoever. Not, no dependency <coughs> at all. To deny them and not allow the mind to come to a waveform with regard to them is renunciation to control motive powers arising from my own experience and so on. These should be governed by them. So this sort of mental strength is called renunciation. Vairagya is the only way to freedom. Swami Vivekananda is now using another absolute only through practice and only that is practice of cultivating counter habits on the one side and only by renunciation is the only way to freedom. And then it goes on to say that is extreme non-attachment which gives up even the qualities and comes from knowledge of the real nature of the Purusha. Now to cultivate counter habits, we have to engage in an overall category of thought and activities that we call sattva, purity of thought. What is purity of thought? Any thought and any action that has no egocentricity within it, no selfishness, all the other activities will be intrinsically selfish. They'll all be egocentric. And the two other categories of waves will be what is called rajas and tamas. Now, according to the yogis and according to their description of things, since one of the most useful ways of thinking of the unseen is to relate it to something physical, and this is why in the yoga system, we have a description of three possible channels or avenues. One is called Ida, one is called Pingala. These have a physical effect, but these are really part and parcel of a mind, of a body connection. And the intimate connection is along a line that is called Sushumna. Eden Pingala is simply 
polarity points or polarity flows. They are to do with the electromagnetic system that is the human body, the physical. But now if we are to take all our energy, because there's only one energy expressed in different ways, physical, mental, and spiritual. If we were taken to take all of that and steer it in a different direction, opening up the unconscious areas. According to the yogis, seven areas are like that. They call them chakra. Chakra literally a wheel. It's only a concept. It's only a description. But all these chakras are levels of consciousness. They are not physical. They are levels of consciousness. But they create for us a connection between the spiritual, the mental, and the physical. And so many people have described them as being commensurate with the solar plexus, the plexuses, and so on, but it is not literally so. No doubt their governing would be over these areas, but the subtle, subtle mind is there. And the first three of these chakras, the lower chakras, really are to do with this world and this worldliness. They are human understandings, if you will, or human engagements of energy that are to do with basic functions. It is only when this potentiality, this potential energy is raised, as it were, to the heart level, where there is, according to the yogi, is described as something like you can imagine it as a petal lotus. Not literally so, but Imagination plays a great part in this awakening. And we can imagine there the opening up of this. At that point only do we find this internal awakening. At that point, does this Kundalini really come up through the Shishumna? Is this really awakened? And then we find a wonderful understanding. First of all, we see that there is a great difference between this internal divine entity that yogis would call Purusha, that the Vedantins would call Atman, we find that there is an identity between that <laughs> and the Supreme Absolute. And we find that there is a distinction between the, that and the physical or the psychophysical. And then as that awakens, 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 finally to what the yogis describe as the Ajna Chakra, in the center of the eyebrows, most people cannot get beyond that. At that point, we find that there is a, a great deal of awakening taking place, but most people's energy will be at the lower centers. So what we call really spiritual development is that uh, every aspirant will have to face spiritual progress um, in, a, in an erratic way. It will not be uniform until there's a flow. And as this unfolds, a flow, a natural flow occurs. And we still have to pay attention to it. But you see, if we had, haven't made initial preparation and purification ahead of that, then the snake can turn around and bite us. It will become extremely dangerous to us. Spiritual unfoldment doesn't take place in a straight line. That's something we have to understand. But every day should be a small refinement of it. That is, every day should be an intensification of our practice of our detachment. Every day should be, we should see some level of progress, not in a linear way, but in a quality way. The quality of spiritual life has to be refined more and more and more. And after reaching um, a higher center, the aspirant may find even the way is closed. 
and maybe we can get stuck at that center, as it were. And maybe our energies can also be sidetracked. And it may take a long time before we can find our way again. And sometimes we will find ourselves going round and round without making any progress whatsoever. But these intervals or dry periods, which as I mentioned before, are described as dark nights, dark nights of the soul. The Christian mystic St. John of the Cross mentions this. And these are usually unavoidable in every one of our lives. But their intensity and duration can be reduced. They can be reduced by this refinement I'm talking about. When the aspirant, when you, when me, when we follow the more moral path, that is not morality in terms of judgment, but morality in terms of increasing and refining the qualities of purity and strength and love and goodness and harmony, a real feeling, getting out of the obstacles. Over-intellectualism can be an obstacle. Over-feeling can be an obstacle. Over-doing can definitely be an obstacle. When we can get over these obstacles bit by bit, then we are on a moral path. And if we are able to do this with the element of steadiness, steady practice, taking advantage of days, taking advantage of times in the day, taking advantage of these opportunities that present us or present themselves to us. What do I mean by that? Anybody who's opposed to you and stands in front is an opportunity, an opportunity for a better reaction. Any difficulty, financial, domestic, or international, is an opportunity to look at things differently. So there are no difficult people, no matter how you complain, no matter how you wish that things should be better, there are no difficult circumstances. There are only opportunities. You can take it in a fun way with a certain philosophical attitude that if this whole world is something like a divine play, then we should surely play the game very well. That means we will have a different view. We won't see a struggle. We'll see an opportunity. We'll see it as God dressed up in this way. Not testing us, not at all but asking for recognition. Do you recognize me? Yes, I recognize you. Then let's play the game. All right. And in doing that, we'll automatically engage in this renunciation or detachment. Purity of mind, strict regularity and devotion. These ensure smooth spiritual practice or spiritual progress. So the description of the rise of the Kundalini appears to be simple and easy enough on paper, but actually it's all very difficult. And as we know from the Bhagavad Gita in the seventh chapter, of maybe a thousand people who struggle for it, only one may get awakened. But there's no need to get discouraged because there is a principle of evolution. This Kundalini, this coiled up thing, represents also a potential for manifestation. In Swami Vivekananda's language, each soul is potentially divine. The goal is to manifest this from within, manifest, to unfold, to evolve. So it is, in, to some extent, something that happens by itself. We just have to prepare the way to make the crooked path straight. See angels going before us to make the crooked path straight. All we have to do is invoke them. And so we find that it's only good that we can unfold this Kundalini slowly. It is important that it doesn't awaken all of a sudden. Most people are not at all ready for this rise, as it were, this transformation from potential to kinetic energy. In fact, in the beginning of one's spiritual life, it's better to forget all about this Kundalini. And I only mention it because it comes up so frequently. 
and comes out largely as a misunderstanding. And it's much better to think of God. Let the love for your chosen ideal, your most beloved form of God that you can relate to, that you can speak to, that you can listen to, that you can admire, that you can get to know, not all at once, but the joy and love is in the discovery of this Ishta Devata, day by day, bit by bit. I was describing in the UK somebody's possible natural Ishta Devata, something that maybe they had never considered before. And I was saying, you see, if you have this as a historical entity, try to find out how they walk, what they ate, how they talked. For example, if you love Christ very much, should you not imagine how the son of a carpenter, how he walked, where he walked, what he said, what he ate, how he encouraged the fishermen, what power he had to say to unknown persons, come follow me, and immediately they followed. What kind of thinking did such a person have when confronted by a lame person? Take up your bed and walk, and he takes his bed up, and he walks. What kind of magnetic personality stands on a mountain and reveals his divinity? What were the simple words that he said to us in private? as a small group around a fire while we cooked the fish supper for him. How did we lay down, lay some soft material so that he could lay his head? The son of man has nowhere to lay his head. So we can imagine an itinerant preacher who sometimes had to resort to solitary places to get away from his popular following and not knowing really the depths of his personality. Only later would I recall, how does his face look? How did it shine when he spoke to us? How was he calm in the midst of a storm? When the great storm came and threatened to overthrow our boat, how he was very calm and simply commanded waves and they stopped. What kind of personality was this? How do we get to know such a personality? So this Ishta Devata can absorb all our attention and all our energies. And we can leave this Kundalini up to him. You look after your spiritual welfare. This entity that we in religious language call God will grant you awakening and will grant it to you at the right time. It's better to follow the path of synthesis in any event. We're all karma yogis. We're all jnana yogis. We're all bhakti yogis. I came across a devotee saying, oh, this jnana yoga path is very strange. I don't understand it. Well, we all have to discern. We all have to use our sensible judgment in finding out what we should do, what we should not do, and what is worth investing in, what is not. One simple example, we value the human body so much. And yet when we look at it properly, we see on the one side a miracle of engineering, divine engineering. We can see the complexity of a cell and the compound of the cell called the human body. And yet it is so fragile. A mere sword will end it. A disease will end it. So fragile, so vulnerable it is. And yet it is working so efficiently as far as it is. And yet when we look at it, we see it is not just that within this miracle of engineering is also other things. Those people who have romantic ideas, I really like telling them, yes, you see, but are we not all carrying around with us a septic tank? Is there not phlegm within us? The last few days I've had some coughing, a lot of phlegm came up and so on, you know. Is this an unpleasant thing? People don't like to hear about these things, but it's a very, it's a fact. It's a fact that we have bones, a framework. It's a fact that we have tissue and muscles. It's a fact that a fluid called blood goes around the body. It's a fact that we have bone marrow. marrow. It's a fact that we have an occupation. We are a virtual city for 
trillions and trillions and trillions of microorganisms. But we don't see it, nor are we meant to see it. But we can at least understand that this body is not the total investment. This body is an instrument. It's a useful instrument. It's a wonderful instrument. It's an efficient instrument if we pay proper attention to it. But that's all it is, is merely an instrument. So with uh, these few words that uh, something to do with the refinement in meditation, I can leave off there. Uh, hopefully this uh, small discussion, if you will, of refinement in meditation is of some practical use here. So we end like that. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace. Oh.